1928. In a little less than seven years, the Kuomintang's revolutionary government, led by Chiang Kai-shek, grew from a mere insurrection to China's main power, and the Chinese Communist Party, which only counted 50 members in the beginning, now had its own army dispersed throughout the countryside in the south of China. Beijing, the official capital, was still however controlled by the old marshal, Zhang Zuolin, leader of the Fengtian clique and master of the Beiyang government. Three armed factions were in competition. In early 1928, the Kuomintang, now financially backed by the US, Britain and several banks in China, could reorganize and re-equip itself to pursue the northern expedition. The National Revolutionary Army counted 700,000 men. On the other side of the Yellow River, the National Pacification Army, controlled by Zhang Duolin, counted only 450,000 soldiers. However, it possessed Renault FT tanks that the French army had left behind after the Siberian expeditions against the Soviets. It was also heavily influenced by the Japanese, who had control of Korea and many parts of Manchuria. In spring, the National Revolutionary Army successively captured Tangzhou, then Jiaxing, and arrived at Jinan on the 29th of April, where the Japanese had had a garrison since the end of World War I. They started to circle the city. The National Pacification Army, led by Zhang Zongchang, the dogmeat general, fled from the town and withdrew further north. In parallel, the Japanese Imperial Army mobilized troops from the China Garrison Army, based in Tianjin, into Jinan, to protect over 2,000 Japanese civilians in the city. The situation was tense. Although the Kuomintang was not at war with the Japanese, strong nationalistic feelings led its members to hate them. On the 2nd of May, Chiang Kai-shek arrived into town and promised the safeguard of Japanese civilians in exchange for the withdrawal of Japanese soldiers. Local Japanese commander Hikosuke Fukuda agreed. The next morning, however, a handful of Japanese civilians were killed by Chinese. Chiang Kai-shek wanted to pursue the northern expedition and deal with the issue later, being close to the targets at Beijing. But General Hikosuke was determined not to let the insult unpunished. After proposing an unequal treaty to the Kuomintang that they knew they could not accept, the Japanese army launched a full attack on Jinan, killing thousands of civilians and some soldiers. Chiang Kai-shek knew he could not fight the Japanese army, so he abandoned Jinan and its surroundings to pursue his campaign north. The Japanese, whose authority was only growing, sent a message to both the Kuomintang and Fengtian clique, telling them that any fighting in Manchuria would result in an Imperial Japanese army's intervention. In order to dissociate himself with any responsibility at the Jinan incident, which the Kuomintang was trying to reinforce through propaganda. Zhang Zuolin responded by stating he would not recognize any Japanese interests in Manchuria. At the same time, as the National Revolutionary Army gained more territory, he and the National Pacification Army gradually retreated back to Manchuria by train. The statement he had made was a grave mistake, as the Japanese had him assassinated a few days later by exploding a bomb on his train. Many of his officials and officers died on the spot. Mortally wounded himself, Zhang Zuolin was transported to one of his nearby homes, where he died after a couple of hours. Leadership of the Fengtian clique was transferred to his son, the 27-year-old Zhang Xieliang. On the 6th of June 1928, the National Revolutionary Army finally entered Beijing unopposed. No blood was shed over the historical capital city. The Beiyang government was over. Zhang Zuolin's son, Zhang Xieliang, nicknamed the Young Marshal, with the intent of ending the war in China, swore allegiance to the Kuomintang. A few thousand soldiers, led by Zhang Dongchang, however refused to surrender and were consequently destroyed by the National Revolutionary Army and Zhang Xueliang's forces over the next few months. The northern expedition was finally concluded on the 29th of December 1928. The national government of the Republic of China, internationally recognized as the sole legitimate government of the country, was set up, and its only capital was Nanjing, Although a few final rebellions against the centralized government took place, China was officially unified for the first time in several decades. In the south of China, the communists had been clandestinely reorganizing themselves. In big cities such as Shanghai, they created the Zhongyang Teke, an intelligence agency of their own. 
Guerrilla tactics, landlord persecution and expropriation had allowed them to establish several Soviet areas in different provinces, as well as gaining the support of the peasantry. The Chinese Red Army had grown to a near 100,000 troops. Zhu De and Mao Zedong, who controlled the largest portion of the forces, known as the Fourth Army, established the Jiangxi Soviet that would become the heart, both militarily and politically, of Soviet China. Ho Long controlled areas in Hubei and led the Third Army. Zhou Enlai, overseeing underground work in Shanghai, became the de facto party leader. He advised against a full-scale revolution for the time being, rather encouraging the strengthening of the party and army. Deng Xiaoping, an old friend of Zhou Enlai, became a Red Army figure and led several uprisings in the south. Peng Dehuai, a Kuomintang officer, defected the communists and took charge of the 5th Army. Inevitably, the communist forces were growing, reaching over 140,000 troops by 1930. Chiang Kai-shek, realizing the dire situation for the integrity of China he had only just reunified, decided to launch a series of campaigns to suppress the Chinese Red Army, known as the Encirclement Campaigns. The objective was to isolate pockets of resistance and destroy them. Two major problems, however, stood against him. After the Northern Expedition, he had ordered to greatly decrease the size and budget of the National Revolutionary Army in order to finance modernization and development projects for the country. Secondly, the Chinese Red Army was now specialized in guerrilla tactics, while the National Revolutionary Army was only experienced in battlefield fighting. Furthermore, the spies the communists had planted within the Kuomintang through their intelligence agency allowed them to discover crucial information about the military operations. Due to this, the first and second encirclement campaigns were total fails for the Kuomintang. The Chinese Red Army inflicted over 100,000 casualties to the National Revolutionary Army, suffering itself only minor losses. At the same time, purges started to take place in the communist ranks, as rivalries within their leaders began to appear. A few major figures distinguished themselves, such as Mao Zedong and Zhu De. Zhou Enlai, still based in Shanghai, however stayed ahead of the party, taking care of political rather than military maneuvers. While Chiang Kai-shek was preparing a third campaign, a completely unexpected event happened. On the 18th of September 1931, the Japanese sabotaged the railway line of the Japanese-owned South Manchuria Railway and accused the Chinese of the incident. The Imperial Japanese Army then flooded Manchuria with tens of thousands of soldiers and occupied the region. This was a prelude to the Second Sino-Japanese War. Taking advantage of the situation, Mao Zedong made his move. He officially founded the Chinese Soviet Republic and became its leader, with Zhu De as second in command. They were shortly after joined by Zhou Enlai, who tried to limit the purges as much as possible. Chiang Kai-shek wanted to deal with the communist forces before tackling the Japanese threat, a policy known as internal pacification first, then external resistance, and he launched a fourth encirclement campaign in 1932. Although successful in his tactics defeating the Red Army, he and the National Revolutionary Army commanders decided to leave too soon, allowing the communists to regroup and rebuild the Chinese Soviet Republic. By now, Mao Zedong held most authority in the communist ranks, eliminating anyone who challenged him. In 1933, determined, Chiang Kai-shek launched a fifth and final campaign. As he looked towards modernization of his armies, he sought out foreign advisors. Nazi Germany, which had just been born, sent Hans von Sicht, a World War I veteran. Sino-German relations were largely accelerated. This time, rather than charging into the Soviet areas, the National Revolutionary Army, advised by von Zicht, besieged them, building fortifications and letting attrition break the morale and strength of the Red Army. It would also force the communists to open battle rather than guerrilla tactics. By summer 1934, the communists were utterly defeated. They managed to create a gap in the encirclement at the cost of many more thousands of casualties, and started a massive retreat of several thousands of kilometers led by Mao Zedong, this movement, that would last over a year and see over 90% of its members die along the way, was the Long March. About 36,000 soldiers were on the run. The National Revolutionary Army did not bother pursuing the mass rout, preferring to eliminate the remaining pockets of communists elsewhere. The few shattered armies that survived the assaults independently joined the Long March to northern China. By 1935, the Kuomintang had restored Chinese integrity in the south of China. The communists gradually reorganized in the north, creating a second Red Army. Chiang, however, started to be heavily criticized for 
Hispania's failure to adopt a strong policy towards the foreign powers which had torn and ravaged the homeland, as his old ally Hu Hanmin put it. Zhang Xieliang, who had withdrawn through Manchuria when the Japanese invaded in order to preserve his troops, also grew impatient. In order to end the civil war in China, he secretly met with Zhou Enlai several times to discuss the issue. They agreed to stop fighting against the orders of Chiang Kai-shek. Zhang Xieliang and another nationalist officer, Yang Hucheng, devised a plot to force Chiang to handle the Japanese problem. On the 12th of December 1936, they kidnapped him in Xi'an, where he had relocated to oversee anti-communist operations. For two weeks he was held captive, until he agreed to stop his repression of the remnants of the communists and adopt a strong anti-Japanese policy instead. He was in a dangerous position as many nationalist officers, as well as communists like Mao or Zhu De, wanting him dead. On the other side, however, Zhang Xieliang, Zhou Enlai, and even Joseph Stalin himself, who understood the importance of a common resistance for the time being, and the symbol that Chiang represented for many people, urged not to have him executed. The nationalist leader was released on the condition that he would change policies and cooperate. The Second United Front was born, and alongside new slogans such as Chinese should not fight Chinese, peace within the population had returned. Chiang was nonetheless extremely dissatisfied. He put Zhang Xieliang under house arrest and executed many officers who partook the Xi'an incident. With peace returned, the communists could fully reorganize. The Red Army was officially incorporated into the National Revolutionary Army as the 8th Fruit Army and New 4th Army. The Chinese Soviet Republic was dissolved. The Japanese, meanwhile, kept sending soldiers from their home islands to all areas they controlled in China, mainly Shandong and Manchuria, but also great parts of the surroundings of Beijing. On the 7th of July 1937, they crossed the official border next to Beijing for military exercises. One Japanese soldier, Private Shimura, went missing. After realizing his absence, the Japanese accused the Chinese of having kidnapped him, when in reality he had gone to a Chinese brothel. After sending an ultimatum to the Chinese that was refused, the Japanese, counting over 5,000 soldiers, started to encircle the historical capital city. The Chinese defense, counting no more than about 100 men, desperately opened fire. In a brittle yet reunited China, the Second Sino-Japanese War had begun. The first phase of the Chinese Civil War had ended, but it was clear that neither Mao Zedong nor Chiang Kai-shek were prepared to share China once the Japanese would be defeated. Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. And if you have any questions or requests, please leave them in the comment section below.